Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who. Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not. I couldn't figure out why, and then they hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, Invictus Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Arnaldo Leon, and hopefully you are doing well for yourself. You, your friends, your family, whether you live in the States or internationally, I hope you're doing well for yourself during a time of major uncertainty. And so let's talk about UFC 252. I've been trying to hype up my friends to, hey, watch this event. It's the biggest fight in heavyweight history. Miocic against Daniel Cormier. I'll be talking about the rest of the card here. Really fun card. It was a really fun card all, all around. I was excited the entire way through. There were some eye-opening moments here. There were some so- shocking moments, controversial moments. But overall, uh, UFC 252 was a very fun show. And there is a lot in stake and a lot of news to cover here for today's episode. But let's talk about the main fight here. Miocic against Daniel Cormier. Great fight. It was absolute stellar fun fight to watch. Steve P. Miocic won the fight via, you know, it's like unanimous or majority decision. Yeah, I think unanimous. It was by unanimous decision. Goes towards Steve P. Miocic after five rounds of action, defeating Daniel Cormier after the fifth round. So Miocic was able to win, and Daniel Cormier says that he is retiring. Sort of, half heartedly. Because <laughs> Daniel Cormier says, well, the only way I'll be able to f- come back and fight or continue to start fighting, would be if it's for a title. If it's not for a title, then I got nothing else to prove, and I don't want to compete and, or, and go back. And before this fight happened, Dana White, when asked about what his opinion is on Daniel Cormier's retirement, Dana White says, uh, you know, Cormier, he says that, but I don't really believe it. You know, I don't think really it's official or final that he's retiring. And so Cormier, when he says, you know what? I might continue fighting if I get a title fight. Dana White's like, yeah, of course he would say that, totally. But Cormier also said that he didn't see a title fight anytime in the near future. And to be honest with you, I don't see it. It's official and final. Miocic defeated Cormier. We could see Cormier against John Jones. Three. That would be a fun fight to watch. But John Jones has to go fight Dominic Reyes. And also, John Jones says he's moving up to heavyweight. I thought that's what he claimed. And they don't, you know, I'll go into a lot later in the podcast here. But right now, light heavyweight and heavyweight division, things are getting kind of clogged up right now in terms of what the scene is. And Daniel Cormier, he's retired. Unless he gets a title fight anytime soon, which he isn't going to. We're not going to see Daniel Cormier back in the octagon, at least for, you know, two years. You don't know. Fighters always change their minds all the time. Look at Dominic Cruz. And so for Mio Chichik and Daniel Cormier, I'll be talking about the rounds here. So first round could go either way. It really could have. First round, I choose Stipe Mio Chichik winning that fight in the first round, at the very least. And weird, because when, if you look at the bottom left, because all the time there's a UFC event, in the bottom left hand of the screen, you see uh, the Twitter reactions, what people are guessing or what people are making predictions on. It's like fighters like Aljamain Sterling or celebrity like, Lebr- like LeBron James. And in the bottom left, pretty much everybody in the bottom left-hand side of Twitter said Daniel Cormier won the first round. And the reason why Daniel Cormier won the first round, and that's the reason why people come to that conclusion, is because Daniel Cormier got a knockdown, sort of. He got sort of knocked down. Okay, so it wasn't an official knockdown, but if the fight were to continue on for about another four or five more seconds, Daniel Cormier could have gotten knocked down on CP Miocic. And because of that potential knockdown, people gave the score towards Cormier because he won it in the final 30 seconds. Yeah, but I always look at these fights accumulatively. I know there are people who have this viewpoint that if you're the one who has, like, who's winning by the end, you should be rewarded. 
That's the logic behind why John Jones defeated Dominic Reyes. And that by the end of things, Jones winning. But that's that shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't. I mean, it's like basketball or football. All because you go on a scoring run. If you're, if you're down by 30 points in an NBA game, and then you go on a scoring run, and you score 15 straight points, and you like you just stop your opponent from scoring at all. Yeah, your performance in the final two minutes was really awesome and great. Good for you. But you shouldn't be rewarded for the final two minutes over the course of a wait, 12 to 48 minute game. And that same logic applies to football. If the other team has five touchdowns on you, and you score three consecutive touchdowns in the span of three minutes, oh, that's great. Good for you. But guess what? You're still under the scorecards. It doesn't matter how good you finish. All that matters is what you do in the totality of your performance. And so Cormier, I think up until the final 30 seconds of the first round, was not doing good for himself. He wasn't. So, and, and, and when I say not good, I meant that like he wasn't doing as good or better than Miocic. And here's pretty much how all five rounds worked, kind of. Uh, how it kind of worked out. So, it was, I predicted this would be a lot more passive fights. Like both fighters would fight a lot more safer. And Daniel Cormier would go and try to aim for clinching and try to aim for wrestling and try to go for, you know, dirty boxing. Because that's what Daniel Cormier's strength is. He's incredibly good. Dirty boxing, he's really good at underhooks, and he's really good at, you know, the wrestling game. He's better than all, in all, he's better in those facets than TP Miocic is. And so Dan Cormier, he attempted a takedown in the first round, and he got a takedown on Miocic. He did. But Miocic was able to stand right to back up. So Cormier was able to get a takedown. It is listed officially on the, um, uh, on the UFC official, uh, UFC stats here. But because Cormier didn't really do anything, off top position, Miocic was able to get back up within the span of like honestly like twenty seconds. It was like a takedown. Less than twenty seconds later, Stipe Miocic gets up. So you really can't reward Daniel Cormier for that. Kind of, you can kind of reward him, but also, but it, it, it's weird how you how you. I don't know it's, it's kind of weird how you do this stuff. Daniel Cormier he got a takedown, so he got points for that, and he got a, he could have got potential knockdown in the first round. Yeah, and also I think Daniel Cormier had. Initially, more significant strikes. He did initially. But then I checked, and then the scorecards popped up again. And it was like, Daniel Cormier had like 12, 28. It was like 12, 28. Cormier had 12 signum strikes. CP Miocic, 28. So Miocic had 16 plus in terms of significant strikes. So I thought, okay, the scorecard, okay, the, the, the number, like the statistical number between Cormier and Miocic's performance in the first round was significant enough to the point. And also it was such a close fight already. It wasn't like Cormier was dropping bombs on Miocic and Miocic was struggling. And no significant strikes came from the straight up jabs. No. It was a very back and forth fight. Cormier got a takedown. He got a potential knockdown. But Miocic accumulatively was doing really well for himself. He really was. He was doing some significant damage onto Cormier. And the numbers show it. And then we go to the second round. Second round, Miocic won it, uh, especially by the end of it. If the fight were to continue on for a couple, for honestly, for like 10 more seconds, then Miocic could have got, uh, could have won the fight. He really could have. And here's the funny part. I think, I think it's at this time, Dominic Cruz was just, <laughs> Dominic Cruz was doing commentary here and Joe Rogan. So Miocic got a knockdown. On Cormier, and then from that point on, like Miocic is dropping bombs onto Daniel Cormier. Daniel Cormier, he knows there's about seven seconds left, and so Cormier, Cormier's idea was like, okay, I'm just gonna hold on and tuck my chin onto the tummy of Stepi Miocic. I'm just gonna endure what I can endure for the next seven seconds. And Dominic Cruz. Being the most like loudest person in the freaking room, man. He was like, "All right, then." Daniel Cormier. He recognizes there's like seven seconds left. Will the referee stop this fight? Will he screw Cormier? How will how will the referee potentially end this up? Huh? huh? As a Cor- Dominic Cruz, in the span of like seven ten seconds, went on this like weird like tangent rant where it was obvious he was taking things super personally because it was a similar situation. 
to when Dominic Cruz fought against Henry Cejudo, in that Cruz like, all right, I got like a couple seconds. I'm just gonna tough it. I'm just, I'm not gonna really block. I'm just gonna tough out the final five seconds here. I'm gonna tuck under my chin, so I'm not gonna, so I'm kind of protecting myself just a little bit. And it was a similar scenario here with Cormier Miocic, in that Miocic was dropping bombs on Cormier, and it would make logical, complete sense for the referee to stop it. And Dominic Cruz recognized it, and he was like, no, 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 no. I remember this. I remember this. Hopefully the referee doesn't mess this up, just like my fight. <laughs> so seven seconds later, Cormier gets pelted, uh, and then the f- and re- re- second round ends. Third round, kind of the same thing in that, like, no. Third round, Daniel Cormier was incredibly passive here. So the strategy behind this was that Daniel Cormier was just going to take a breather in this third round here. And that he wasn't going to exert that much energy. He's going to throw away the third the third round. And he's going to exert a lot of energy in the fourth, fifth round. Which kind of did work in the fourth round. Fifth round, not so much. But because Daniel Cormier was taking a breather in that third round, it led to Stipe Miocic just exerting his, like his strength and his energy and just doing clinch work onto Cormier. It was by the... Beginning of the fifth round, they should have numbered, like, the clinch control number here. And it was, like, Stipe Miocic had, like, three minutes ahead of Cormier in terms of clinch control. And a lot a lot of part, a lot of this fight involved Stipe Miocic pressing Cormier, clinch controlling him onto the cage. So, first round, statistically, was Miocic. Second round was obviously Miocic. Third round was also obviously Miocic. And then fourth round happened. Fourth round happened, and this was easily Daniel Cormier's best round here. Like Cormier, he saved up a lot of energy in that third round and was able to go a, a, um, a couple of good quick bombs. I think it was the only round to which Daniel Cormier defeated Stipe Miocic statistically in terms of like, striking numbers, significant strikes, total, uh, totality of numbers. So yeah, uh, Daniel Cormier, he did a really good job in the fourth round. And so we're going into the fifth round. And in the bottom part of the screen at UFC 22, it shows the Twitter. People are saying it's 2-2, 2-2, 2-2. Even the commentary team, Dominic Cruz specifically, says it's 2-2. So let's hypothetically say that Daniel Cormier won the first round. I don't think so. And he obviously won the fourth round. All right then, 2-2, whatever. Let's go with that logic then. That didn't actually pan out. So in the fifth round here... Okay, anyway, going to the fifth, going to the fifth round, by the end of the fourth round, Miocic had this really yikes, this eye poke here. Cormier eye poked Miocic also early in the first round, and it's the Miocic eye poked Daniel Cormier in the fourth round, and it was sick. It was a sickening eye poke. They did it in slow motion, the eye poke, and Miocic's eye poke was so strong that it created this like slow motion ripple effect onto Cormier, and you can hear Joe Rogan and Dominic Cruz be like, all right, here's the eye poke. Here's the eye poke. Whoa! <laughs> Dang! Ouch! So Cormier looked bad. He went to, uh, he went to the fifth round. He went to this corner, man. Like, they're icing up his eye. They're icing up his head. Cormier says he can't see anything off his left eye. Fifth round, uh, fifth, uh, fifth round happened. That eye poke severely stomped. It's like it just stopped Daniel Cormier from making any progress here. He felt super uncomfortable. He felt very passive. He was still going out there throwing bombs, but oh my god, Miocic man, he took shots here that would obviously knock him out in other fights, but in this scenario, he just isn't. So uh, CP Miocic, he just outboxed Daniel Cormier here. He also outclinched him in the in the fifth round. So my scorecard. So no, the judges scored this fight forty nine forty six. Stipe Miocic. He had uh, he had three rounds over Cormier. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I I say first round Miocic, second round Miocic, third round Miocic, fourth round Daniel Cormier, fifth round Miocic. So I in my opinion it was absolute. That Miocic defeated Daniel Cormier. And Daniel Cormier in the post press, in the post press interview, he goes on to say, Oh man, dude, I can't see anything in my left eye. I just can't. I was thinking if I could go do some wrestling in the first round, and I was able to do so to see if I can do it. And then I started getting gassed out, I started getting tired, the clinch thing kinda got to me, and I just stick towards boxing. 
And I thought I really thought Dan Cormier should have went towards wrestling more often. I really think he should have done that. Um, but he says, you know what? I don't have anything else to really prove. Really, I would like to come back and fight for a title, but that's not going to happen anytime soon in the heavy or light heavy division. So that's the end of me, and I'm done with my career. So Daniel Cormier has retired from mixed martial arts. Steve Pimiocic is now officially the greatest, without a doubt, not disputed. He is the greatest UFC heavyweight of all time. Francis Ngannou is right on the cor- is right on the corner. John Jones is right around the corner. Alexander Rosenstrike he just defeated JDS in a really impressive performance. He's right on the corner. Things are getting wild in the heavyweight division. So you're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Coming back right after the short break here. See you soon. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So I am discussing UFC 252, Daniel Cormier against CP Miocic. And uh, there's a lot of blame going towards Mark Goddard because in the end of the fourth round, Daniel Cormier, when he got poked, he looked over to Mark Goddard, the referee, and was like, hey man, I got poked in the eye. I got poked in the eye. And Goddard said, keep fighting, keep fighting, keep going, keep going. And so Goddard didn't stop the eye poke. Or did he didn't look over the eye poke that Miocic gave onto Cormier. But he looked over the eye poke when Daniel Cormier uh, poked Miocic. And so there's a lot of blame going on right now. Daniel Cormier attests that the eye poke really did significant damage to him. And that's why he had a, um, he didn't do a good performance in the first, in the fifth round. Mark Goddard on his Twitter it says, I practice that what I preach and as a man I stand tall and head on. If you accept plaudits, then you must with mistakes too. That's proof that you are listening, honest, and plural improvement, rough with the smooth acceptance and ownership immediately after the fights. When seeing the replay, I apologize to Daniel Cormier and his team, and I do so publicly and, unres- and unreservedly for missing what I should have ha- what I should have have, but I cannot call what I do not see. I don't have replays and multiple angles. It's a one shot take in real time. I cannot convey just how much I have both lived and loved the sport for the for the past twenty years. I truly appreciate all who understand. Okay, I understand. Being referee, it's a difficult job. It really is. You can't see everything that happens. But oh man, dude, that eye poke, it's um it's a it's a bad miss. It's a really really bad poor miss here. But what's going on with the heavy division? Now that Steve Miocic is now the champion, and here's the thing, uh, Miocic was was considering retirement also himself. And now, according to Miocic, he feels really excited. He he says he's he doesn't feel like he wants to retire anytime soon. He's doing really good for himself. He was really upbeat, optimistic, and really proud of himself in the post-fight press conference. He was really jovial. He was joking all with a lot of people. It was really fun. It really was. And so someone asked him, hey, who do you expect to fight in the future? And Mitch was like, you know, I don't want to think about that. I just want to relax right now. I am in this for the long haul. And I'm going to fight anybody. I'm going to fight anybody. And then after the, after, I don't know, before the interview, actually, it was, it was shown that John Jones tweeted out, that he says that he wants to go fight Miocic at heavyweight. It was also reported that Dana White said that John Jones was given an ultimatum. He was given the option of he either has a title fight, a title rematch against Dominic, uh, Dominic Reyes, or he vacates the light heavyweight belt and moves up to heavyweight officially. So first off, I'm like, thank you. Oh my goodness. I do not want to see... 
another champion versus champion fight because oh my goodness, there is absolute there's like little to no stability for the most part for about half the the weight divisions here. There's just no stability here. So I'm happy that John Jones. So now that we know get we're getting we're getting this from John Jones Twitter it might not be official, but John Jones says you know what he is gonna go move up to heavyweight. So he will vacate the light heavyweight belt. At least that's the idea. That's the idea behind it, though. But also, right now, Francis Ngano, he's the obvious person who is next to go challenge uh, Stipe Miocic. It makes the most sense. Uh, Dana White goes and say, Francis Ngano, not John Jones, definitely next for Stipe Miocic. So, yeah. So, Dana White himself says it should be Francis Ngano. It really should be Francis Ngano. Uh, there are reports out there that it was going to be John Jones against Ngano because from... Jo- but Things fell out from John Jones' camp. So I think it is right to award Francis Ngannou for, you know, he's going out. He lost his, uh, you know, he has very bad performance against Derek Lewis. Bad performance against Stephen Miocic. He is able to go bounce back. He's made some improvements. So yeah, it makes sense. Oh, it's coming in from uh, Jones won't jump over Ngannou. So yeah, Dana White says John Jones will not jump over Francis Ngannou. So let's say Stephen Miocic were to fight Francis Ngannou like it's official. Officially, what will be that? Will be next? What's going to happen in the heavyweight division then? So there are multiple avenues you can you can go take this through. So you can give it to John Jones after Miocic against uh, Francis Ngannou. It can be uh, it can be whoever wins the fight of Ngannou versus Miocic will go fight John Jones, which is going to suck. It's going to suck for fighters in the heavyweight division. It'll suck for fighters like, Kurt, like Curtis Blades and Jazena Rosenstrike and Oscar Overeem. You know, and even Derek Lewis. Derek Lewis, I can't believe it, is like one of the more skilled fighters in the entire heavyweight division, and he's doing awesome for himself. He really is. So Miocic against Jones or Ngannou versus Jones, those are two mega big fights. Mega big fights. Whoever fights John Jones, oh man, dude, that's gonna be a fun one. Fight of the year canon right there. And also, according to Dana White, he believes Israel Adesanya versus Paulo Costa, which is happening on my birthday. You know I mean? Um, it'll be September 26th. He says that, he says that fight could potentially be a fight of the year candidate also. And the only other fight that he says, which would, which would be a fight of the year candidate was Yuan Ai Chi versus Wally Zhang. So I expect fireworks. Hopefully there are fireworks on my birthday in Adesanya versus Paulo Costa. But I'm currently looking here at the light heavy division right now. Dominic Reyes. <laughs> okay, you know what? I would personally like it if they do John Jones versus Dominic Reyes one more time. Just one more. Uh, John Jones will fight his last light heavy fight against Dominic Reyes. Win or lose after this fight, then he goes and fight. Then he goes on and fights against the heavyweight champion. To me, that's the best bet right now. But Jones says that he's focused on heavyweight division. Here's the thing. It upsets me when you have fighters who decline an option or opportunity. Like, I feel like if a, if a champion declines to fight somebody, they should be vacated. It happened with GDR, Jermaine Duranime, and then she declined to fight against Chris Cyborg, which led to her title being vacated. So, I think it's only fair for, if it's, it's fair that, for, okay, yeah, just do that. And Ganu fights against Miocic. John Jones fight against Dominic Reyes. Win or lose for John Jones. He can either he can either end his run as light heavyweight champion as the absolute greatest of all time with no asterisks to it because right now there is an asterisk to his fight against Dominic Reyes and that he should have lost that fight. Like every other fight John Jones has had in his light heavyweight career, 100% Jones won. He 100% defeated Diego Santos. He 100% defeated Anthony Smith. Dominic Reyes split. That was a split decision. So Jones versus Reyes and Francis Ngannou versus Tipe Miocic. Those are, those are the two fights to definitely go out and look for. So let's talk about the co-main event here. Oh man. Sean O'Malley against Marlon Vera. So I said this would be Sean O'Malley's biggest test. And the fight ended in a way that nobody... Expected. Okay, first off, I love the... I love the preview video they did for Sean O'Malley. Man, Sean O'Malley... He is so hyped and he is so primed to be the guy. 
he really is. With the way how the video, like the video preview, like hype video was presented, there was no other fight. Like I don't remember a single fight that had this type of promotion. What I meant was for every single fight out there, whether it be JDS or Jazenda Rose Strike or Sylvia Miocic against Daniel Cormier or even like the potential Jones versus Dominic Reyes fight, you kind of know what to expect after hype video. It's going to be, hey man, I'm going to come up and I'm going to do my best. I'm going to fight this guy and I'm going to be the champion. Um, I'm training really hard, man, and I'm going to put everything in the line. Like, you know what they expect. You know the buzzwords. But for Sean O'Malley versus Marlon Vera, it wasn't the traditional sense of a hype video. It was like this like hip-hop rap videos. They added a whole bunch of sound effects, a whole lot of like graphic effects to the stuff here. It was like a Hollywood movie. It really was. I think everything else, like everything else was just like normal HD, and the, it's like Miocic, Courtney, it was just like basic HD stuff, but then you see Sean O'Malley and Marlon Vera, and the way how it was filmed for their matchup, it was like 4K, there's a lot of scripted stuff happening here. These fighters, instead of like sitting in, uh, like instead of sitting like in front, like in their gym, or like in their house, it was like Sean O'Malley in the throne room, and it's like weird, like super bright background. You got Marlon Vera being high. so. That is like Marlon Vera is the is the traditional veteran fighter who wants to like prove himself. Sean O'Malley is this young up and coming guy. He's got an entirely different video presentation, an entirely different way of being hyped up. He looks different from everybody else. The way he talks is different from everybody else. Sean O'Malley has the it factor. Now then, let's get to the actual fight here then. Marlon Vera won via TKO in the first round, 4 minutes and 40 seconds in, into the fight. Here's, but here's how, <laughs> Sean O'Malley really defeated himself in this fight. He really did. So O'Malley was doing great against Vera. Doing awesome. Hitting some great leg kicks. Stellar leg kicks. Going in for some feints. Has some really good jabs. Moving very quickly, like honestly, the way how Sean O'Malley was just out kickboxing Marlon Vera looked awesome and great. And then it happened. Sean O'Malley, he went in for a feint, and instead of shuffling his feet, we, we see fighters this, like, like they're shuffling their feet. Sean O'Malley shuffled his feet like a couple times in his fight against Marlon Vera just to brag. He's doing it for the cameras. He's doing it for all show because he's a showman. And then Sean O'Malley, as he was shuffling his feet, as he was going for a feint, he stepped with his like, he stepped with his left foot forward, and instead of stepping on his heel or flat on his feet, he stepped on his like, the toes of his feet. And then like, obviously something went, oh, something buckled in his ankles. And then after he, fa- and after like he went for like, the failed feint, he started limping. And then he, he started throwing out no leg kicks at all. He stopped feigning. He stopped moving. He was very passive. It went from Sean O'Malley pressing the action to Marlon Vera pressing the action. And Sean O'Malley is not really doing anything. Sean O'Malley, good for him, man, for having a heart, dude. He just throw, started throwing out right haymakers. He was like, alright then. There's no way I can do an actual jab. There's no way I can go through and throw leg kicks. There's no way I can throw any punch. With like a lot of force. The only thing I can do right now is I have to knock out Marlon Vera stationary. But no, Marlon Vera being the proper veteran he is, man. He, he didn't take any of the bites. He didn't take any of the fates of Sean O'Malley. He fought very patiently. He found his opening. And then he had a knockdown on Sean O'Malley. Okay, what, what, <laughs> I'm looking at the fight stats right now. Like, there was no official knockdown. Weird because he, he did. So he had a knockdown on Sean O'Malley. And they started doing ground and pounding. He laid a really good, like, right over, like, right overhand onto O'Malley. And a really vicious elbow. Started doing some ground and pounds. And then, uh, Herb Dean, who was the referee for this fight, he stopped the fight early. And Joe Rogan said it. He was like, wow, that was a very interesting stoppage there. And that Herbert, uh, Herbert Dean, he recognized that Sean O'Malley, his right, his left ankle buckled. He wasn't going to stand up. Sean O'Malley had another fight like this. In that like his left ankle buckled. And there was absolutely no way he could go stand up fighting. He couldn't. But the only, the only reason why Sean O'Malley won that fight really was because his opponent was an idiot. And he, just didn't, and he just didn't stand up. He was doing these like really weak ground and pounds that just led to nothing really. 
But Sean O'Malley, his left ankle is down. Herbie recognized this, and he and he recognized that there was no way Sean O'Malley would stand up. Marlon Vera is throwing out these vicious shots from top position. And here's the thing. Was it an early stoppage? Yes, it was definitely an early stoppage. Was it the right stoppage? Yes. Because after the fight got stopped, Sean O'Malley, dude, he could barely walk. He was limping his way out of the octagon. The dude just didn't have it. There was no way, absolutely no way Sean O'Malley could go continue fighting another round with the injury he had. So good. Good stoppage right there. Good early stoppage by Herb Dean. Marlon Vera won that fight. It sucks that there's going to be asterisks to Marlon Vera's, uh, Marlon Vera's victory here. But he defeated a top, not really top rank, but he fought a ranked fighter in Sean O'Malley. And now Vera, he's aiming to go fight somebody in the rankings here. Still, he, he had a, you can't, you can't predict this stuff. You, you just can't. You have to be, opp- you have to be opportunistic in this business. And Vera was opportunistic. It really was. It was funny because in the post fight press conference, in a post fight interview, he didn't know that Sean O'Malley, that he got an injury. He just thought like Sean O'Malley just like didn't want to throw a leg kicks anymore because he checked it. But yeah, um, Vera, he feels super confident about himself. He's right now, tra- he, he's trash talking Sean O'Malley, Sean O'Malley because Sean O'Malley laid a whole lot of trash talk. So Marlon Vera, he's got this like whole level of confidence in him now, which is like really funny. But Vera, he defeated Sean O'Malley via TKO. Uh, the only thing holding back Sean O'Malley really are injuries that you just really can't predict that happened in the middle of fights and other previous fights. So hopefully Sean O'Malley, he gets back on his feet, literally, and Marlon Vera, he goes up in the rankings. So you're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Come back right after the break discussing UFC 252. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So I am discussing UFC 252. I discussed Stephen Miocic against Daniel Cormier. I discussed Sean O'Malley against Marlon Vera. Miocic and Vera won their fights. And so what happened to the rest of the card here? We had JDS, Junior Santos against Jason Rosestrike, Herbert Burns against Daniel Panetta, and John Dawson against Marab Davashvili. So JDS against Jason Rosestrike, this is an opening fight here. I thought this was a very, very close fight. I say JDS, I don't know, I, I kind of, he had a really good showing. He honestly did. Jacinda Rose Strike, okay, let me give you the fight stats here quickly. So, JDS, he landed 54% of his strikes, 24 out of 44. He also landed, he landed the same, all of his strikes were significant, so good for him. Jacinda Rose Strike landed 42 out of 66, 63% of his shots landed, and 42 out of 66 were, yeah, yeah both JDS and Jacinda Rose Strike had the, had pretty much the same number of total strikes and second strikes. And then Jacinda Rose Strike in the second round got a knockdown, and he just completely stomped JDS here. So in the first, the first round happened. Both fighters were kind of passive here. JDS was incredibly passive. He had a still. It was a good showing by JDS, but for the most part, Jacinto Rosenstrike. He really just pressed the action in the first round. Second round, he was getting tired already. So he was getting tired. He was getting very passive. JDS was just completely murking Rosenstrike, and it was in the final. Yeah, so it was within like the three minute mark of the fight here. 
that Rosenstrack, he was being very passive and he was waiting for a good counterpunch. So Rosenstrike, he was laying it on to JDS in the first round. Second round was all JDS. And then Rosenstrike was like, all right, I'm just going to go like take a couple hits here by JDS. Really brave by Rosenstrike, by the way. Good for him. But uh, Rosenstrike, he was kind of rope doping. He was baiting JDS out there to go and try to go for, you know, a front for a knockout punch, which he kind of was. JDS was like throwing out these like insane right haymakers at times. And so J- uh, Rosenstrike recognized it. He was like, all right. I'm a bait in JDS, and like he's gonna go shoot in for like a right for a right overhook, and I can go for a counter punch. And he did that, so JDS slowly willing down Rosen Strike here. Rosen Strike is ducking and dodging and blocking, and then he finds this really good opening onto JDS, goes in for a knockout punch, knocks out JDS, does <laughs> the, does some ground and pound onto JDS, gets a knockdown, and Rosen Strike wins the fights. Rosen Strike wins the fights. After that humiliating, humiliating loss he had against Francis Ngannou. So good job for Rosen Strike there. Uh, they're not gonna move up anywhere near the rankings, to be honest with you. They're not, they're both within the top 10. I think Rosen Strike is within the top 5. But right now, Rosen Strike, he's in the same boat as Curtis Blades in that they're just stuck in the top 5 until the situation with Dominic Reyes and John Jones, until that's done. Till then, Rosen Strike, Curtis Blades, Overeem, they're not really going to go anywhere in the heavy division. Also right now, Augusta Sakai, he'll be fighting against Alistair Overeem. And if Sakai gets the victory there, they get smoothed in the top 10. And I think it'd be a fun matchup to see, you know, Curtis Blades, Frozen Strike, and also uh, Augusta Sakai have like have some, fi- have some cup fights. And then we go to Feather, we had Herbert Burns against Daniel Pineda. This was a scrap fight. Out of any, out of any fight in this entire card, this honestly was the most scrappiest. And then we got, and also it was like balanced out fight, and that we had like two fighters that were like dead on even in terms of skill and speed and matchups here. And then Daniel Pineda was able to go get the KO, TKO on Herbert Burns, two minutes, uh, no, uh, second round, four minutes and 37 seconds in. So, uh, <laughs> I say this is a close fight. I just like, based on the eye test, it kind of was. I don't know, I just for the first round, it felt really close here. But, Herbert Burns, 35 of 48, total strikes. 10 of 22, significant strikes, 3 of 4 takedowns. Oh yeah, so that's the reason why I felt it was kind of close, actually, because Herbert Burns, there were moments, actually, where it looked like he was going for submissions, but he just kind of gave up on it, though. And then Deo Panetta, 173 total strikes out of 205. 57 out of 75. He got 8 takedowns, but that was reversed towards like Herbert Burns, really. Uh, Panetta, really strong performance. I think he also got, he won performance of the night, also. So good for Panetta there. And they got John Dawson against Mirab Davishvili. Mirab Davishvili, this guy is a wild man. Not only is this dude a gigantic bantamweight, he is amped. Like, <laughs> by the end of every round, and like, by the end of beginning of every round, it was just him yelling. He was so hyped up. He is so pumped and optimistic in life, dude, that there were occasions where Mirab Davishvili would be like, yeah! And Don Dots, 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 John Dawson would look at the camera, he will look at his court man, he will look at Davashvili, and he was like giggle to himself. But yeah, oh man, dude. So Davashvili landed 2 out of 20 takedowns. Davashvili, who is who normally puts like a wrestling clinic on people. Dot, John Dawson, man, he was great. Oh my goodness. John Dawson had an amazing defensive wrestling performance against Davish Feely. But the problem with John Dodson, it's a problem with him that I've had for years, is that John Dodson, for as talented and as good of a fighter as he is, as pretty of a fighter as he is in terms of technical boxing and his footwork and all that stuff, for as good as his wrestling is, like John Dodson is a complete fighter. He really is in the bantamweight, in the bantamweight, and also at um, flyweight. Yeah, flyweight. At flyweight, John Dodson was a beast. He really was. But lately, when you look at John Dodson, he fights really passive. He fights very safe. He's now a counterfighter, even though for the most part, even though, like I'm so used to him. I see old John Dodson from like five years ago, and he was always a pressure fighter. He was really good at pressuring people. But his turn to Marab Davishvili trying to take down John Dodson as much as he can while pelting Dodson 
with a lot of strikes here. And yeah, D- John Dawson, he did a great job fighting defensively. He really did. <laughs> he did a good job defending himself. But defending yourself is only one aspect of the fight game. He didn't do anything at all as it pertains to pressuring the fight. And his counter punching didn't do significant enough damage to impress anybody. So John Dotson landed 34% of the strikes, 31 out of 90, 27 out of 86 significant strikes. Marabra Oshfili, 88 out of 171 total strikes, 50 out of 133 um, significant strikes. And landed 2 out of 20 takedowns. This Davish Billy man, the dude's a beast. John Dotson is a defensive beast. But Ryan Dotson was way too passive. He was way too passive. He wasn't at all active all that much. And you know, he didn't look that upset. You know, he's making money. I can't really buy him right now, but there's no way. I don't see Dotson at all climbing his way either back up in the flyweight or bantamweight divisions. I'm being that honest with you. I just don't see it right now. Mayor Dallas Feely, well, what Dallas Feely really has to work on a lot, he really should work on, is keeping his opponents on the ground. He is awesome at taking people down, except for this scenario here against John Dawson, but Dawson's a really great defensive wrestler. But Dallas Feely, he just can't pin people down. He's strong. The dude's obviously a big bantamweight. The dude's gigantic. Alright then, the guy's obviously a very powerful fighter. He's good. He's got. He's a good boxer. He's got a tough chin. He will always press the action. You will never have a boring fight with Merab Dalishvili ever. But oh my goodness, it he just can pin fighters down. And not it's not just John Dotson in his recent in his recent uh, fight. I don't remember the fighter he fought against, but Dalishvili in his recent fight, it, it was the fight where he landed the record for most takedowns ever in Batman history. Good, good from for doing that. But he just can't pin people down on the ground. And just lay some significant ground and pound. He just doesn't do it. He can wrestle people. He can throw people. He can pick people up and throw them on the ground really freaking hard. He can box. Good for him. But his inability to pin people down and his inability to go and keep the pressure on onto the ground after getting a takedown is a huge red flag for Merab Dawashvili. Dawashvili, he has, he has so much potential. All the signs are there for him to be a really awesome fighter. And he is an awesome fighter. But I can't see Dallas Feely compete within the top 10 unless he learns how to pin people down with his wrestling. That's the honest truth. He can go take down a dude as many times as he wants. He can go and power slam people, spine buster people as much as he wants. But unless he is able to keep them in the ground to do some actual ground and pound... I don't think his wrestling is all that impressive. I don't think so. So, I don't know who Devish is going to fight next, but I expect a better performance in his next showcase here. That's what I expect. Alright, so let's go move on to the news brief, and that is free agent Michael Chandler. Dana White was talking about Michael Chandler in, a, in the UFC 222 post-press conference. Somebody asked him, hey, how do you feel about Michael Chandler going to the UFC? And he says he'd be up for it. He would. So it is coming in from MMANews.com that now given he is about to enter free agency, that would very that would be very well the case. For Dana White, it says he's interested in meeting Michael Chandler. I'll love to meet with him. Yeah, the guy's earn it, man. Dana White said on the UFC 252 press conference, Chandler is coming off a first round knockout victory over Benson Henderson, a former champion in the UFC, in his final fight with Bellator contract. Before that, he also scored a first round knockout on Sydney Outlaw to get back to the win column after being knocked out by Patricio Ferrari to lose his lightweight title. In his career, Michael Chandler has normal wins over Eddie Alvarez, Martin Head, Goti Yamiuchi, and Brent Primus, among others. Yet Michael Chandler does go to the UFC. There are tons of fights for him, uh, like including Paul Felder, Dan Hooker, Dustin Poirier. That di- lightweight division definitely needs a former champion in Chandler, considering that we're still unsure on what the future is for Khabib Nurmagomedov. Uh, Khabib, he actually did a recent interview where he was talking about what his opinion is on who he should fight after Dustin, after Justin Gaethje. Now obviously, Gaethje versus Khabib, this might be the biggest test in Khabib's career. It's obviously gonna be the biggest test for Justin Gaethje's career. But when asked about, oh, who's next after Gaethje, if he were to win? Khabib says, 
if Connor can defeat Dustin Poirier, he would be open to fighting against Khabib. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, if Connor defeats Dustin Poirier, Khabib would be open to fight against Connor. Would I like to see a rematch? Kind of, just because, you know, they're both big name fighters. But Khabib also says that he is really up to a fight against GSP for his final fight of his career. So yeah, interesting. Cody Garbrandt shows Sean O'Malley some love following UFC 252 loss. This is coming in from BJPan.com. And obviously, you know, Cody Garbrandt, his, he had a really good performance in his last fights. He moved camps, not really, he kind of have hardly moved camps, and that he's still training with Team Alpha Male, but he's able to extend out there, go to New York, New, go to New Jersey, get a new striking coach, and it worked well for him. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing the old, we're seeing the old Cody Garbrandt, we really are. He, he's gone through a series of losses, he, he, he went through a period of time, he went through years of not winning, but after winning his last fight, there's a lot of hype going back to the former champion. And also, he's been kind of feuding with Sean O'Malley. He's been giving a lot of jabs onto O'Malley because O'Malley is making all these big proclamations that he's going to go and become, you know, one of the greatest of all time. Cody Garbrandt, being rejuvenated, believes that he can be a double bill champion. He can go be a flyweight champion and be a featherweight champion. Oh, no, no, yeah. No, bantamweight champion. That's how it is. He can be flyweight and bantamweight. So former UFC bantamweight champion Cody Garbrandt has shown Sean O'Malley a bit of love after Sugar Sugar Sean O'Malley was stopped by Marlon Vera back at UFC 252. Sean O'Malley and Vera glided at UFC 2 in the co-main event, to which O'Malley didn't end well for himself. And so, what was that? So Sean O'Malley, if you check up on his Twitter, there's an image of him smoking while there's like a hot chick, and it's weird. He posted a really weird image of himself on his Instagram. And Sean O'Malley put down on his Twitter, humbled. In the replies for the post, Garbrandt, the former UFC Bantamweight champion, offered O'Malley a bit of reassurance. So he goes to say, happens to all of us at some point. Garbrandt offering a bit of wisdom to Sean O'Malley is likely to come surprise to many fight fans as both of them have been trash talking each other for a while. <laughs> both men fought at the recent UFC 250 card, knocking out Rafael Sunsau and Eddie Wyland. After these victories, the pair began drawing back each other. Cody Garbrandt saying that his knockout was better. I still remember this card. It was... They both gave me the same reaction. Wow! Awesome! Whoa! Talk about amazing! And in the commentary team was talking about who had the better knockout, Sean O'Malley or Cody Garbrandt. <laughs> By the way, if you guys haven't checked out Marlon Vera's um, post-press conference interview... I oh, mean, it's fun because Marlon Vera has so much confidence in himself, dude. It's ridiculous because he came in as a quiet guy. And I was like, yeah, his foot got injured because I am really good and awesome at throwing leg kicks. That's why I showed him a lesson. Sadly, there will be an asterisk in Marlon Vera's victory over Sean O'Malley. And that's just the weird sad truth. That's the sad reality of things. But Marlon Vera, he says he is a top 10 fighter. After this fight, I don't think he's in the top 10. He needs one more fight. He needs to win one more fight to get in the top 10. And so you're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast. Come back right after the short break here with some more MMA news and hot takes. See you later. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. And we are back. So before I get back into the MMA hot takes, this is coming in from BJPan.com. Paula Costa reveals he is 220 LBS pounds just six weeks out of UFC 253 title fight against Israel Adesanya, which is happening on my birthday. Yay. Paula Costa has really beefed up ahead of his time. <laughs> so who, wait, wow, I love that comment. So who, who wrote this down? This is coming in from Chris Taylor. So Chris Taylor says that Paula Costa has really beefed up ahead of his upcoming UFC middleweight title fight against reigning division champion Israel Adesanya during last night's UFC 250 broadcast. The promotion announced that the highly anticipated fight between Apollo Costa and Israel Adesanya will be coming up at UFC 253. Dana White talked about this fight being incredibly exciting and last time he made, well, last time he made a prediction that one fight is going to be incredibly exciting was Joanna versus Wally Zhang. And I expect this fight to be very exciting because Apollo Costa is not a counterfighter. 
Israel Adesanya is a great counterfighter, and he will bring it if the other post, if the other opponent brings it also. Izzy's, Izzy's fight against Leo Romero was not fun. It was tough to watch. It was very boring. Because it was two fight, counterfighters going at it. Compare that to Paulo Costa versus Leo Romero, which is a much more exciting fight. Paulo Costa is much more aggressive, and he's a lot more assertive in the action. But now we got these two fighters uh, going at it, and uh, Paulo Costa, man. So there's a <laughs> there's a video that came out of Paulo Costa's like personal YouTube channel, titled "Finally Broke the 221 Pound Barrier." So Paulo Costa, he's gained weight. The man has gained weight. He is bigger. He is stronger. If you've seen any of the videos that have been posting up, that have been posted for Paula Costa in any of his training videos, the guy looks gigantic. The guy looks like he should be a heavyweight, but he's not. <laughs> it's it's absolute insanity. Here's a weird part. He can compete. I can see a world where Paula Costa can compete at either light heavyweight or heavyweight. Because he's that huge. He's been getting bigger by the second. And it's not just me. Other people have been commenting on it. Joe Rogan has been commenting it on that Paulo Costa is the biggest small man in the game right now. And what I mean by that is that he competes at 185, but he looks like he's he's walking around like 237, 242. The guy is gigantic, and that's him like trying to cut weights. Let's say he wanted to go gain like weight, and not I mean muscle weight. I mean like he's going the carbs. Eating food to go like to 250. That guy will look huge. That guy's a monster. Absolute freak. I'm excited for the fights. We've got the skinny twig who's surprisingly really strong. And then we've got this really big buff model looking dude. Who looks like he can break someone like a Twix bar. This is also coming in from BJPen.com. <laughs> there are a lot of people slamming Sean O'Malley. And now Henry Cejudo is doing that. Henry Cejudo slammed Sean O'Malley. This two pump chump broke his nail and can't compete. He says, I fought DJ and Marlon with no legs. This two pump chump broke his nail and can't compete. But hey man, freak accidents happen. I'll be honest with you, it wasn't Marlon Vera kicking Sean O'Malley so hard that he can't stand up. It was a freak accident. And also, I don't know what's up with Henry Cejudo. Like, what's going on with him? Last time I saw Henry Cejudo was in AEW. All Elite Pro Wrestling. It's a pro wrestling show. He was having a, he was alongside Mike Tyson with Vitor Belfour because it was supposed to be Mike Tyson versus Chris Jericho up until the whole COVID-19 issue kind of really hit hard on the world of pro wrestling. But it was going to be Chris Jericho versus Mike Tyson, Vitor Belfour and Henry Cejudo entouraging for Mike Tyson in this pro wrestling show. Now, I don't know what's going on. Mike Tyson <laughs> Mike Tyson wants to make a comeback in the world of boxing I would watch it I need to find a date but I'll watch that definitely but what's going on with Henry Cejudo here Henry Cejudo would be a great character in WWE or in AEW but you know with COVID-19 being a huge issue right now people are traveling also Henry Cejudo just being recently retired you know I wouldn't mind not seeing Henry Cejudo for a while but he still watches his, his mixed martial arts fights. He still does, and he's still calling out people. And a, you know what really irks me? I don't like it when fighters call out people. When you call out other fighters, even though you're not, you're probably not gonna go fight each other. You're probably not. But let's go towards some hot takes over here. Uh, who was he told by though? Floyd Mather, he runs his own promotion, and the guy, no, that's not really it. Uh, Stipe Miocic beats Henry Zahudo. I know a lot of people disagree. But it is what it is. <laughs> Henry Cejudo versus Stephen Miocic. I okay. So do you know what? This Russo had an interview with the Schmo. Really funny interview with the Schmo, by the way. He's like one of the only young interviewers out there with an actual personality. And Schmo was asking about Conor McGregor making the comeback. Why is Conor McGregor still ranked, even though he's technically retired? Kind of. Is Conor McGregor even signed with the UFC? Is he? I don't know. Don't fighters have to fill out some fights in a year? 
I re- I'm really unsure about that. But Dana White goes on to say that he hates catchweight fights. Like that's some that's one of the things he absolutely hates the most in his job is that he hates catchweight fights because they don't mean anything. I agree with him. It annoys the heck out of me when a fighter loses weight. I mean, when a fighter struggles to cut weight, they don't end up making it because it's now a catchweight bout. Like instead of a lightweight fight, it becomes a catchweight fight. And then yeah, yeah, one fighter gets twenty percent of the purse. That's all good and all, but the fight doesn't really mean anything. It just doesn't. One hot take here is I don't agree with grappling separations at all. This is MMA, and if you can't get off me, that's your problem. Figure it out or you lose. Fans who boo grappling, go watch kickboxing and boost the numbers. You'll love it, and it deserves recognition. Resetting a boring grappling contest on the feet is like taking Nganu and Lewis and resetting them to guard. <laughs> oh, man. I was talking about this with my non-MMA friends. Should fighters be forced? Or should, yeah, is there a scenario where fighters are forced not to fight their style? So let's say so Daniel Cormier against Derek Lewis is a perfect one of this. Like the grappler versus the striker fighter here. The striker who's got no business at all grappling the ground here. He fought against Daniel Cormier. Daniel Cormier recognized, okay, I know I can strike with Stipe. I know I can strike with Derek Lewis. <laughs> He's like, I think Cormier has more confidence in himself striking with Stipe Miocic or even like Alex Galinic or Fabricio Verdum or an Oscar Overeem. He's more confident fighting them, but he's not confident fighting against a Francis Ngannou or Derek Lewis in a boxing fight. Daniel Cormier recognizes, I'm not that dumb. I'm not that much of an idiot. I know what they suck at. Stipe Miocic, he can wrestle, he can grapple, but I ain't, gra- but I ain't, f- I am not gonna go punch. Or attempt to strike on either Nganu or Derek Lewis. Because they're going to knock me out. So I ask you the question now. Should fighters... Like if, if someone is grappling with another... With, if someone's grappling with another fighter. And the fighter obviously is going to make his way back up. Should the referee break it up. And reset the fight on, the, uh, on stand-up. Should they? And the person with the hot take saying, well, guess what, MMA fans? You, if you're an MMA fan and you don't appreciate the grappling, go watch boxing or go watch kickboxing. And I told, I was, I was talking to my friends and they said they find a lot of MMA fights boring. They do. They dislike it when they're clinching with each other in the cage. Here, Kamaru Usman versus Hori Masvidal is the perfect example of the type of fight that would turn away somebody from watching UFC. It's this, yeah, it's the truth. It really is. And so I started thinking myself, and I'm thinking about NBA now, bro, basketball. Can you imagine if there was no 24 second shot clock? Because for sport, sports, it's sports entertainment. Damian Lillard, uh, Damian Lillard and Carmelo Anthony had an interview about this, about their roles as basketball players on the court. And they said, and also Dwayne Wade, he says, sports is, also a performance. It's also a performance art. You're performing in front of a large crowd of people, whether it be 500 people, 200 people, 10,000, 20,000, in front of hundreds of thousands of houses out there, over a million houses that are watching the fights. There's a performance aspect to the sports. Because here it is. If you want mixed martial arts to be at its absolute purest, put two people, lock them in a single room, have no audience there, have no commentary team, have no rounds, have no referee, just a purest two people fighting. You don't want, you wouldn't watch that. Let's be honest with you. If there are two people locked in a room and they said, hey, you two go fight each other right now. Nut shots are perfectly fine. Eye gouging is fine. There are no referees, no judges. No commentary team, no audience, no camera crew. Those two fighting in that room is more pure to the sense of mixed martial arts than any organized event in whether it be UFC, Bellator, one championship. That's more pure. But here's the thing. Is pure always right? Is it best for business? Because sports is business. Is it best for two fighters 
to you know fight each other if it's going to end up being a very boring being a very boring fight. I wouldn't watch mixed martial arts if every fight was boring. He wouldn't. Some uh, put it here, <laughs> even hotter take. He's not that. Robbie Lawler isn't all that exciting. I'll be honest with you. Robbie Lawler and Don Cerrone, they can be very exciting. They can be. But they also can be very boring. And I did not like, I am not the biggest fan of Robbie Lawler's recent performances. I was disappointed in his performance against Don Cerrone. I was even more disappointed in his fight against Kobe Covington. Kamara Usman would beat Khabib Nurmagomedov. Yes. Kamar Usman versus Khabib. Who would win in a wrestling battle there? Usman. He's just bigger. I say they're equally skilled. But if you judge who is a better fighter between two fighters, you have to look at two things. You have to look at, you know, you have to look at the physicals and the intangibles. They both have the intangibles. Alright? They have the skill. But you have to look at the physicals at that point on. Um, I watch basketball all the time. And... There's a player out there named Zion Williamson. And we're always saying that he's got the physicals. 100% down. If only he developed a skill. Now then. Who is physically superior? Stephen Curry or Zion Williamson? Who is the better athlete? Sage Northcutt or Khabib? I can guarantee you right now, if there if there was an Olympic contest between Sage Northcutt and Khabib, Northcutt would stoke Khabib in all the physical sports. He would. I genuinely believe that. Whether it be high jump, track and field, track and field, the long jump, I believe Sage Northcutt is physically superior than Khabib Namagamidov. But he isn't as skilled and he isn't as experienced as Khabib. And that's why Khabib, and Khabib's wrestling is out of this world. So who is physically superior? Who's got the higher potential? Who is more likely to become the greatest of all time? Sage Northcutt or Khabib Nurmagomedov? Sage Northcutt. Who actually is the better fighter? Khabib. Who's got more potential? Sage Northcutt. But we're not talking about, you know, potential doesn't make you a great fighter. It doesn't. And when you have Khabib against Kamara Usman... Where you're looking at them side by side, what, what do these two fighters bring to the table, table that the other doesn't? Usman can do everything that Khabib can do. Khabib can do everything Kamar Usman can do. You know why? The physicals. Khabib isn't the best athlete in the world, but he is without a doubt one of the best wrestlers in the world. He's one of the best MMA fighters in the entire world. He's one of the best fighters in the entire world. Is he one of the best athletes in the world? I don't think so. I really don't. And that does it for today's MMA Hot Takes. If you have any more other hot takes, go and message me via Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. You have been a great audience. And this brings to an end for today's podcast. You have been awesome today. You've been a great audience. All I gotta say is thank you. Thank you for listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.